Welcome. Welcome, everyone. <laughs> that was great. Welcome to ideation to implementation. That was fantastic and changing the different ways that we were cheering. In fact, whenever we have innovative ways, uh, whenever we want to engage in innovation, there's actually three different purposes. See, the first purpose of innovation is to fix something that exists. We did this at the beginning. We were cheering okay, but we needed to cheer louder. We needed to cheer a little bit louder. So we were doing a bit of a value analysis to find a way to fix what was existing. Uh, another way that we can be innovative is to improve. Uh, whenever we are improving something that already exists, uh, we're going to identify the good parts of what, ha of what already exists and ways to enhance that value, right? So we were still clapping, but we went from a regular clap, a more generic clap, to an Icelandic clap. Sometimes whenever we are innovative, we create something entirely new. And so we t draw inspiration from Queen and we will rock you. There are three different purposes to innovation and we must first identify why we want to be innovative, why we want to develop something new, or why we want to develop something to fix or improve so that we know our purpose, we know our why whenever we are moving forward. Sometimes we have inspiration to create something new. We have inspiration to improve. We have inspiration to fix something. And we begin with some design thinking. So uh, you can't see my slides. Let me try and fix that very quickly. Um, let me try that one more way. We'll take that out. Draw it back in. If you can't see them, we'll just do without. Nope, they're not changing. Mm, let me try one more thing. That doesn't work. Can you see this? Ah, all right, I'll just use that. Okay, perfect. So we'll go from ideation, we'll, we'll begin with design thinking. So we'll start with inspiration. This is, uh, we are inspired to fix, improve, or create something new. And it's from that inspiration that we have new ideas. And it's from that ideation that we then move into implementing those ideas. And that is how we successfully uh, create the future. Now, whenever we go through design thinking, whenever we go from inspiration to ideation to implementation, there are a few general journeys that we go through, both in the innovative process, in our emotional process, in our project leadership process. Uh, there are a few trends that we can expect. Uh, so whenever you are beginning your implementation, or maybe you're in the midst of implementing an idea at your job, you might be experiencing some of these trends. So first, we go through a pendulum swing of, of uh, creating many ideas, right? So we might be diverging. We're expanding the scope as we are uh, brainstorming, as we're thinking of all the possibilities, right? We're disrupting. And then we go through a season whenever we are developing. Right, so this is when our ideas converge. So it's important that we have both. This is a pendulum swing where we ask, okay, what are ways, this is a specific time that we're going to expand. We're going to come up with a lot of ideas. Now we're going to hone in on a few ideas. We might go through an emotional pendulum. So we begin with hope in our ideation phase we think of all of the possibilities. These are all of the things that could happen. We're very hopeful for what is to come. And then we might have a bit of a dip as we enter into insight. Uh, we see this a lot whenever we're doing estimations, right? 
We're very hopeful in our estimations. We go, yes, we can finish this in six months. And we very quickly move into insights and realize a few things that we didn't realize whenever we were in the hopeful state. But then as we continue forward, then we complete or we move forward in the process and we move into confidence. This is a pendulum swing, right? So we go from hope, insight, confidence, hope again, insight, confidence. These are different swings that we'll go through. Your team may go through Techman's cycle of, as a, of a team. Here we begin by storming, we're coming together as a team. We dip, we begin by forming, coming together as a team. We dip into storming. This is whenever we discuss how we are going to work together. What are going to be our processes, methods, projects, our roles? And we establish the norms for our team. And it's in that dip, you'll notice that this is our dip in performance, that as we're going through that storming phase, we establish the norms that will allow us to jump into a higher level of performance. And then we move into the adjoining stage. This is our retrospective if we're using more of an agile model. And we discuss what went well, what could do better, and we reestablish or we re-go through that storming phase to establish better norms to perform at a higher level. And then we adjoin again, right? This is a cycle that we go through. And these are expectations these are predictions that we can make as we are going through our ideation to implementation process. We also go through that disruption and development process. We talked about that earlier, where you disrupt everything, you disrupt what's going on. Here, we expand, we come up with a lot of ideas. Then we develop the few ideas that are going to, that we want to pursue. So these are a few predictions. These are a few common trends that happen with all teams. All right, we're going to go through seasons where we should be disrupting and seasons where we should be developing. It's not that any of these trends are unhealthy. It's not that they're poor. We don't, but the, the goal is that we don't stay in one pendulum for a long time. We don't want to be constantly disrupting and never developing. We don't want to be constantly in one, in the storming phase and never establishing norms. In the same regard, even if we're performing at that higher level, we need to move into that adjoining stage so that we can establish better norms, right? We can re-go through that storming phase to establish better norms to perform at a higher level. So if you're going through this ideation to implementation process, you can expect and you should be proactive in understanding the trends, understanding the predictable nature of going through this process. Now, I just went through a lot of different uh, commonalities with, uh, within teams. Some were emotional, someone's on the idea side. Uh, this is going to be uh, trends in a variety of team dynamics that you can apply. So you can be mindful of this as you are going through this process of ideation to implementation. Keeping this in mind, how can we be proactive to help our teams effectively move from one process, uh, move from one season in the process to the next? How do we effectively move from this ideation session, coming up with a lot of ideas, to the implementation session? I'm glad you asked. So there is a gentleman named John Cotter that he, and he writes of a change model that we can utilize practically within our teams to effectively impact change and effectively implement the ideas that we have. So for the remaining part of our time, I want you to think about a specific idea that you would like to implement. 
This is going to be really important so that you can add value. All right, I want you to think of a specific idea. This could be a personal uh, thing that you would like to implement, right? So maybe a change in you. It's going to be better, uh, more effective if you can think of some sort of implementation that you would like within your team or within a larger group of people. Okay? Giving you a moment. Once you have, let's see, if you have that idea that you would like to implement, give me three claps. Okay, I'll give you a little bit more time. <laughs> I want you to think of an idea, something that you would like to fix, improve, maybe create something new. It could be a new program. It could be a new system. It could be a new process. Okay, if you have your idea, then I want you to, I want you to stomp your feet three times. Okay, that was a few more. <laughs> okay, so as you're thinking of your idea that you would like to implement, Cotter writes that the first thing that we must do is create a sense of urgency. Why, th this may be an important thing to do, but why should we start today? There's a lot of things that we need to do right now, but why should we start today? I know that it is good for me. I would like to implement eating less sugar, but today I had a delicious cinnamon roll upstairs and I had one of those amazing strawberry smoothies. Um, <laughs> I've eaten a decent amount of sugar today. If I had a health crisis, maybe that would be a sense of urgency for me to eat less sugar starting right now, right? So what is that sense of urgency? There are a few, um, there are a few factors that we can use, a few factors that happen in our organizational lives and personal lives that impact our sense of urgency. The first is bringing in an outsider. So we see this a lot with consultants. We see this a lot with new hires. Uh, bringing somebody who is not already in the organization. Many times, the ideas that the outsider brings in, it's not necessarily that different than the conversation that's going on inside. But bringing in that outsider is that extra push, right? Oh, now we're paying somebody to tell us the thing that everyone else has already been saying. This is the incentive to have that sense of urgency and move forward. Right, so it could be a new hire, it could be, be a consultant, it could be somebody from the outside, maybe a guest coming in and saying, uh, and saying something to invoke that sense of urgency. The second is that you behave with urgency every day. Now, this is a true sense of urgency. There is a big difference between a false sense of urgency, meaning thinking that something is very urgent that needs to be done right now, that really doesn't, right? So it does need to be done, but we don't have to be in that panicked state. Having a false sense of urgency can impact the view, right? It can uh, impact your perspective and it can impact the organizational health. If everything is a, we need to get this done yesterday, then that does not uh, positively impact the organizational health, right? So acting with urgency every day means having a bias for action, right? So it means saying, we understand as a team that we're going to come up with ideas and we are going to have a bias towards action, right? Uh, not sitting back. So it's important to understand that difference between real urgency, this is important and it needs to be done now because of these reasons, and false urgency, which is we're going to do this right now because I want it done right now, <laughs> right? So uh, understanding those real sense of urgencies. Uh, the second is finding opportunities in crisis. We all found opportunities in crisis a couple of years ago. Uh, organizations took the opportunity to change. Uh, we saw people that went through digital, we saw organizations that went through digital transformations overnight. 
whenever the COVID-19 uh, pandemic happened. This was an opportunity in crisis for people to act with urgency. And then lastly, dealing with the no-nos. So dealing with the no-nos is uh, what Cotter calls people that are really change adverse. So any sort of change, any idea that you have that you want to implement, they will come up with some reason why that is a horrible idea. Right? They may be a very loud voice in your organization. And so being intentional to speak to uh, and speak with the no-nos, the people that are say no, 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 uh, to any change initiative is going to be very powerful in, in invoking that sense of urgency in your team. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to think about that idea that you would like to implement in your team. Why is it important that you implement that idea now? The answer could be, well, it doesn't need to be implemented right now, but it needs to be implemented in the next six months, right? What will happen if you wait a month? What will happen if you wait a year? The idea that you want to implement, what is your sense of urgency? For some of you, as you're thinking of your organization, you might be thinking, what will it take to invoke a sense of urgency? Right? I know that this is urgent. How do I help with a crisis, bringing in somebody, dealing with a no-no, right? What is your sense of urgency? In your, uh, in your implementation initiative. So what is that sense of urgency? Now we're not gonna, we're gonna start with sense of urgency. This is the first step, is to identify a false sense of urgency versus a, uh, a real sense of urgency. But we're not gonna stop there. Next, we need to build a guiding team. If you can achieve your dreams, if you can achieve all of your implementation desires all by yourself, you're probably not dreaming big enough. If you wanna do something bigger than yourself, then you need to include more than yourself. You need to include more people than yourself. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to, you can pull out your phone, you can pull out a piece of paper. I want you to take a moment and I want you to think of your idea that you would like to implement. And I want you to think of 10 people that can help be your guiding team, that can help you in implementing these ideas. You might be thinking, Amber, 10 people? That's a lot. That's a lot of people in my guiding team. For some of your ideas, they may be very big, and you may be thinking, 10 people, that's nowhere near enough. So, uh, we're gonna start with 10. If you need to add on 10 more, then that's totally fine. Whenever I'm building my guiding team, I may only originally think of maybe three to five people. I want you to sit in that moment and think of more. Do this with a lot of teams, and some teams, they may come up with librarians. They may come up with family members. Uh, they may come up with people in other departments. Uh, here, you are building that guiding team that will help champion your success. Now, this does not necessarily mean that I'm going to call every single person on my guiding team. Sometimes, I may have the list, and I'll just put it up on my desk. Or I'll put it up where I need it. Whenever you're implementing an idea, it's very easy to feel maybe alone, in your idea, or you may have been very inspired, you've had an idea, now you're trying to implement it. And having that list proactively is really powerful in keeping our emotional uh, and, our, and our resources high. So if I'm stuck on a challenge, if I really need a resource, I can look to that piece of paper, I can look to the no uh, notes in my phone, and I can see these are the people who can be in my guiding team. 
So I'm going to expand that to not only people who have a hand, who are going to be the hands that will help you implement, but also the people that will help you holistically implementing this, uh, this idea. All right. So first thing we're going to do, well, we're going to identify, be inspired to implement change. Then we're going to have a sense of urgency. Next, we're going to build our guiding team. After that, we are going to identify, yeah, we're going to identify who is on our guiding team. After that, we're going to develop a vision. Now, sometimes whenever we talk about change, we begin with talking about a vision. Oh, we have to start with our vision. But we begin by that sense of urgency, by having that inspiration, having that sense of urgency to help filter through, right? If this isn't something that I need to address for another five years, then there may be something that's more urgent that I need to focus on right now. So this is a way that we can help filter through our focus, right? Where do we need to uh, be spending our time and attention? So our next thing we're gonna do is develop a vision. There are entire workshops we have in my company, we have entire books on how we can help develop a vision, how we can clarify goals, how we can clarify missions within teams. Uh, there are entire workshops that you can do, especially within global teams, international teams, on developing this vision and clarifying these goals. Here's what we're going to do. Uh, I want to talk to... Um, I want to talk to this side of the room. Don't worry. This side, you won't be forgotten. I'll talk to you in just a moment. I want to talk to this side of the room. See, I can, in case you cannot tell, I came over here from the United States, and I come bringing with me a best practices manual. Now, it's my vision that we do this best practices manual flawlessly, perfectly. Now, like every great speaker, I'm going to read this best practices manual straight from the board, and we're going to put this into practice right now. So I'm gonna ask that this side of the room only stand up. I know, exercise, yeah. <laughs> we're gonna stand up. Now here's what I want you to do. I want you to stand with your feet perfectly in line with your shoulders, your toes pointed to the left. I want you to put your shoulders back, your elbows pointed outwards, your hands near your chest as if you are about to perform a push-up, open palms, your fingertips loose, your eyebrows lifted high, and your mouth in a perfect O shape. Very good. All right, on the count of three, we are going to do steps 10, 11, and 12 all at the same time. Ready? So on the count of three, you're going to go up and down on your toes. On the count of three, wait, on the count of three, you're going to put your hands together and then bring them immediately apart. And on the count of three, you're going to exert a woo and woo sound. Are you ready? See, people are leaving, man. <laughs> all right. Ready. One, two, three. Up on your toes, up on your toes. There you go, a louder woohoos. And stop. Very good. You all may sit down. That's the end of your exercises for today. <laughs> Very good. End of your exercises for today. So, who can tell me what were you doing? What were you doing? Say that again. You were doing as you were told. Yeah, absolutely. Why were you doing that? It's the best practices, totally. So let me ask you, I, I will give you, so I'll, I'll use a Likert scale. I would give you a five out of 10 on the implementation of that. So if you had to improve, that's well, not super great. If you had to improve, if you had to do better, how could you improve in this best practices manual? Yes. Make it simpler. Make it simpler. Okay. Good. What are some other ways? Jump higher. 
practice, practice the steps. Okay. Okay, great. All right, you all may stay seated. You will stay seated for the rest of the day. Don't worry. Uh, <laughs> this side, I told you, you would not be forgotten. So there's fewer of you, but I believe you can be few but mighty. So here is your challenge. This side of the room did a fantastic job. So, in their effort. <laughs> so we're gonna show our appreciation to this side of the room by cheering as, lo as loudly and as rambunctiously as we can with the goal of putting a smile on every single one of their faces, okay? We're gonna cheer as loudly and as rambunctiously as we can with the goal of putting a smile on every single one of their faces, okay? Ready. No, you're not ready. We're not even standing up. <laughs> ready. One, two, three. Okay, very good. You all may sit down. <laughs> so tell me, what was your, what were you doing? Surely as loudly as you can. And, and why were you doing that? <laughs> yes, we're going to show our appreciation for this side of the room. How did you know if you were successful? Yeah, yeah, you were looking at the goal. Yeah, if they were smiling. So let me ask this. If we wanted to get more smiles on their side, uh, more smiles on their faces, we wanted to cheer loudly, more rambunctiously, what are... Um, how could we improve? How could we get more, how could we get them to smile more? You, you all can answer too. <laughs> you could do a backflip while cheering, absolutely. Bring in a marching band, throw money at them. Yeah. yeah, you can, yeah, so we can be very innovative to find new ways to make them smile even more. So here's the reality. Both sides of the room were cheering. But I was able to make one side of highly intelligent, well-educated, professional adults look like buffoons by over communicating, over commanding the how. Whenever we are developing our vision, we can utilize, this is from Simon Sinek's Start With Why, we can communicate clearly our why and our what. And clearly communicate our why and our what, and then allow opportunity for ownership in the how. We're gonna discuss the how more here later in the session. We're gonna clearly communicate, this is all I told you, right? I said, we are going to cheer as loudly and as uh, we're gonna show our appreciation for this side of the room, that was our why. What we're gonna do is we're gonna cheer loudly and the goal is to put a smile on every single one of their faces. So we clarify what we were doing, why we were doing it, and how we were going to be successful. Now notice that the, the discussion of how actually changed, it altered by how I communicated the why and the what. This side of the room was focused more on the steps. Your actual focus, the eyes were looking at me. There were a couple times I kind of put my arms down, people immediately stopped. This side of the room, it took a minute for you to stop cheering because you weren't looking at me, the commander, you were looking at the goal. Your metrics of success was actually the goal, not the person that was commanding the task. Whenever you are developing your vision, the way that you develop the vision and the way that it is communicated will dramatically impact the success of the implementation. So clearly communicate, start with why. All right, we're gonna start with why. 
what is the goal, right? What are we doing? What is the goal? How, how do we know that this is successful? Why is it, uh, and why are we moving forward, right? So we're gonna develop that vision. Thank you all for standing up and cheering. I appreciate it. <laughs> all right, so what have we done so far? We have identified our sense of urgency. If we have a sense of urgency, we've created our guiding team. We know who is in this with us together. We have developed our vision. Next, we need to communicate for buy-in, right? So whenever you're building your guiding team, that is not everyone that will be impacted, right? That is the, the few people that will help you implement this idea. But there's gonna be more people that are impacted that will have questions that you need to clearly communicate with. If you are implementing a new software system, then accounting probably doesn't need to be involved. Everyone in accounting does not need to be involved in the implementation, but everyone in accounting is going to be impacted by this implementation. All right, this is where we must communicate for buy-in. Now, this is a picture of me a few years ago. Uh, I was scuba diving in the Andaman Islands. Now, I had never been scuba diving before and neither had one other person on the group. So there was about seven of us. Everyone else had been experienced scuba divers. And so the master diver came in, said, okay, here's how you use your mask. This is you know, how you go under, gave us a you know, quick 15 minute overview. Then we got on the boat and we went out to the middle of the ocean. After we had went all the way out to the middle of the ocean, put on our suits, got the tanks ready, we were getting ready to jump in the water. We realized that the master diver had not asked a very important question to the other person who had never scuba before. Wanna guess what that question was? Can you swim? <laughs> the individual did not know how to swim. And so there was an assumption of baseline knowledge. Whenever you were getting ready to implement, right? We were getting ready to implement a, a new way of, of scuba diving, right? He, she, he said, this is how you scuba. There was assumptions in baseline knowledge. Do you know how to swim? This was the first question that should have been asked. Unfortunately, that uh, individual, she was with a, a different group, but she couldn't go in the water that day because she didn't know how to swim. So we must ask meaningful questions whenever we are communicating for buy-in so that we can adjust our message accordingly. Generally, whenever you are implementing, especially organization-wide uh, organization ideas, you will need to adjust your message sometimes significantly. As a general rule, if you are discussing an implementation to leadership, or if you are discussing an implementation upwards, then it is a good general rule to summarize and highlight the aspects that will be important to them for their decision making, right? So if they're in a leadership position, they're gonna need a summary so that they can have the right information to make a decision moving forward. If you are speaking organization-wide, so downward to everybody, that is where you may need to expand your communication, right? So let's use the example of, of accounting, right? The head, of, the head of accounting, they're really gonna need to know, how does this affect my department? What, what do I need to know as key information to, uh, uh, to, to make a decision to impact the entire team? Now, if I am the accountant, then there's going to be several steps. There may be several steps in my everyday job that is going to be impacted. I'm gonna need a little bit more information than that summary, right? So we're gonna to have to adjust when to expand, right? When to summarize and when to expand whenever we're communicating for buy-in. How does this impact the individual? What aspects of this implementation do I need to highlight and where should I be prepared to answer questions? Right. 
kind of went through that uh, quickly. We're gonna first begin by asking the right questions, right? What do they know? What do they not know? How will this impact them? If they don't know how to swim and we're putting in, if they don't know the basic system and we're putting in a whole new, brand new complex system, it's probably gonna need to be training. Right, we're gonna need to upskill significantly. Right. So we need to begin by asking the right questions whenever we are preparing to communicate for buy-in. We also need to be prepared to answer questions as well. This is a two-way conversation. Uh, too many times this section of implementation turns into a one-way conversation. Right, so this person is implementing, they're telling us, telling us, telling us, and that does not impact buy-in. We have to be available for a conversation both ways. We have to be, be able to meet people where they are. There is a gentleman named Dr. Mark Rutland, and he talks about pillars of effective communication. Uh, I like these pillars because they are very simple to follow. Uh, so he says that uh, anytime that communication is done well, it's done effectively, these four pillars are taken into consideration. Anytime that communication is not as effective, generally one of these four, four pillars was missed. So. Uh, first, we have to have the right message. This is what we talked about earlier, right? So are we meeting people where they, where they are? Are we crafting the message in a way that can be easily understood? Are we communicating in the right time? Now, timing is much more than not talking to someone at 6 a.m. on a Monday whenever they're coming in for work, right? And so timing can also mean the actual time that you set aside for conversation. So if you are getting ready to roll out a or implement a huge project and you leave three minutes for questions at the end of a meeting, we're probably not uh, setting ourselves up for effective communication, uh, effective time for buy-in. You may not use the entire time, but saying, hey, we've set aside 15 minutes, 20 minutes for questions, that symbolizes, it does show, and it is an intentional way that you can create time for effective communication. So, we have the right message. Is it in the right time? Is this the right audience? Who should and who should not be included in this conversation? Sometimes there are people that should not be included in the conversation. Sometimes there are people that should be included. So really look at who you're speaking to in your messaging. And then lastly, look at the right method. So many times we focus heavily on the right messaging and not enough on the right method. Let me ask you, what, why do you think love letters are so powerful? You can read them many times, absolutely. <laughs> They're permanent, they're personal. It's a keepsake. I found a love letter written to my great, great grandmother a few months ago and it read, fall off the roof. It was a love letter. Fall off the roof, fall down the cellar, but don't fall in love with another feller. Love letters are so powerful because of all the reasons that you said. There's so many, so much power in a love letter. Another reason why love letters can be so impactful is that there is a span of time between every correspondence for emotion to build. While one letter may be received, there's sometimes weeks before the next letter is received. That is a span of time for me to ponder the words. It's a span of time for my emotion to build. 
Now, while this is super, super desired for a love letter, it is not desired in an email. Sometimes we may be collaborating with our team. We may be wanting to implement an idea and something that was fairly low in emotion becomes very emotional very quick as there is that span of time. It's something permanent. You can go back and look at exactly what you said. There's that span of time for emotion to build. And so whenever we are preparing for our method of delivery, we need to keep in mind first the complexity of the message. So sometimes we'll work with teams and we'll ask the question, how many emails will, will it take to solve a problem before it's important to change our method of communication? If it is going to take 32 emails back and forth to solve one problem, that might be better. Uh, a better use of communication could be a phone call, a five minute phone call instead. That's less energy, that does help preserve the energy within the team, It also helps with the emotion. All right, so look at the complexity. Next, you're gonna look at the emotion. If you have something that is of low emotion, then slower feedback loops, totally fine, right? Hey, let's have lunch at one o'clock instead of noon, okay, fine. All right, let's low emotion, we can send that as an email. If something is of high emotion, we need to have quicker feedback loops. So we're gonna look at the complexity, look at the emotion. And then lastly, we're gonna look at the individual, the person. Some people, they prefer, it's going to be more effective for you to have a faster feedback loop conversation. So whenever I say faster feedback loop, that could be a video call, uh, it could be a phone call, uh, it's gonna be those faster feedback loops versus uh, slower would be an email, a memo. For some people, whenever you are looking at the person, that third factor, it could differ for individuals. I'll give you an example. Texting for, uh, uh, there's a person on my team, texting, that is a very fast feedback loop for this individual. She's a very, very fast texter. Texting for me is way over here. I'm a horrible texter. That's a slow feedback loop for me, right? So we have to look at the individual as well, all right? So many times we can focus a lot on the messaging. We may have a great message that is delivered in the wrong method. That's gonna dramatically impact that buy-in that we have for our implementation idea. So we have the right message, right time, audience, and way. Next, we are going to empower action. All right, again, if we can achieve our dreams all on our own, we're probably not dreaming big enough. We need to include other people. I told you we would come back to Simon Sinek, start with why. So whenever we developed our vision, we clarified uh, why we were doing something and what we were doing. The reality is, is that there are many companies there are many teams that may have similar whys and whats. And so I work with uh, a lot of educational institutions. They have a similar why of preparing their students for success in the real world. In the real world right? I work with a lot of healthcare institutions. They have some variations of trying to help people live healthy lives. Right? So we, they ha may have similar whys and whats. The difference in someone that is good and someone that is excellent is how they implement those ideas. In your team, especially if you're leading a team, especially if you are leading an implementation initiative, your job is to clarify that why and that what, and then provide, and then provide opportunities for ownership this is your opportunity to be uniquely better within the how. Now, how to me is a very vague term. Like, what does that mean? There are four specific opportunities within your processes, methods, projects, and roles. What is your process of communication? What is your processing language that you're using, right? Uh, what, what language are you using? What 
is the process of development that you are using, right? So we're gonna use our different processes within our team. We're gonna use different methods. Now methods and processes many times get uh, confused and that's because they are very similar, but they do have differences. I'll give you an example. The, if you are applying for a job, the interviewing method that you use could be a panel interview, it could be experiential, it could be one-on-one. -on -one. There's a different interview method that you can use. That one interview could be a part of an interviewing process, right? So this is the communication method that we use as a part of the communication process overall, right? So we have an opportunity for ownership in both areas. We have opportunities for ownership in our projects. A project in this context is defined as anything with a beginning and an end. All right, so uh, this could be any initiative, uh, it could be any project, any event that you have, this is an opportunity for ownership within your team. And then lastly, you have the ability to empower action within roles. Now roles does not necessarily have to be a specific position. A role could be the role that an individual plays within the team. Maybe they are the encourager. Maybe they are the devil's advocate. Maybe they are lovably obnoxious, right? So what is the role that this individual or that this team has to play within, within the organization? So we're going to empower action by identifying specific ways that we can provide opportunities for ownership. We have just a few steps left. Next, we can build momentum from small wins. One of the biggest challenges whenever moving from ideation to implementation is that we want to implement a huge project, a huge implementation all at once. But by using shorter iterations of change, using smaller user stories, we'll be able to create better momentum and we'll be able to have uh, faster feedback loops faster feedback loops so that we can make adjustments accordingly at a faster pace. So we'll be able to build those momentums from small wins. And then don't let up. This sounds way too simple. You might think, why is this? There's eight steps in this process. Why is this, why is this in here? Too many times, organizations, they'll begin to see these small wins and we become content in our second, third, fourth iteration. When we know that in order to complete the overall goal, we really need eight iterations of change, right? We see this, if you really wanna get a medical professional going, um, we see this happen with uh, whenever we take medication, we might see the changes, we might start to feel it better, and so then we don't take the entire medication that they give us. And medical professionals will tell you that whenever you do that, it uh, does not fully complete, right? We need to take everything that, uh, the, the full uh, doses, dosage of medicine that they gave us, because if we only take a little bit of it, we might feel a little bit better, but it's not going to help us completely solve, uh, solve that sickness. And so, we see that same thing happen in organizations. We start to see a little progress and we go, well, we're better than what we were. And we become content with that. Don't let up. Continue to move forward. We're gonna build those momentums from small change and then continue. This is gonna be really important in your implementation to clearly communicate your vision and say, this is a good win, this is where we're going. Clearly communicate that what and that why. And then lastly, make change stick. You might think, Amber, how do we make that stick? We're gonna go back to that sense of urgency, right? And continue it. Sometimes, whenever we finish a big implementation, say, okay, we're done, glad we got that over with. And then we go back to that complacency where we were until another crisis happens, until another consultant comes in. 
act with urgency. Take the lessons that you learn from this implementation and make it stick within your team. Act with, uh, act with urgency, uh, true urgency within your team. So, as a review, you might be thinking, remember, we've gone through a lot. For Cotter's change model, the first thing we're going to do is become inspired to change something, inspired to implement. We're gonna identify what we want to do, how we're going to be innovative. Do we wanna fix something that already exists? Do we want to improve? Or do we want to create something entirely new? It's from that inspiration that we can then generate ideas. We get to work with amazing people, like the people that are here at this conference and here in this room, and we can generate amazing ideas for the future. Don't let those ideas die here in these conversations. Take these ideas and come up with a plan to implement these ideas. And we can implement these ideas through this model. Take this inspiration and move from ideation to implementation by first identifying a sense of urgency. Why is this important now? Create your guiding coalition. Who is going to champion this initiative? I'm gonna ask you one step further. Whose initiative are you helping to champion? Can you be on someone else's guiding coalition? Build that guiding coalition. Develop a vision. Remember, that does not mean identifying everything that, needs, that people need to do in micromanaging. It means casting a vision of why and what so that people can be empowered to take that action. We're gonna communicate for buy-in by clearly communicating the right message to the right audience in the right way at the right time. And then we're going to empower action through specific opportunities for ownership in our processes, our methods, our projects, and our roles. We're gonna build momentum from our small wins. And then as we see those small wins, don't let up. Don't let up, you're almost there. Then you're gonna make change stick. Help the ideas, right? So after you've implemented one idea, get inspired. Come up with a new idea. So we continuously create the future. Now, we have gone through a lot. This is a lot of ideas. This is a lot of content. Gone through a lot of ideas in a short amount of time. And whenever I think about all of these ideas, it reminds me of uh, several years ago in, in another life, I uh, actually became the only American, I was the only female, and I was the only blonde academy football coach or soccer coach for the Adidas Game Day Academy and Paris Saint-Germain uh, PSG Academy in Bangalore, India. Now, I coached a variety of uh, football teams, coached about 13 different boys teams uh, and a couple girls teams. And I remember my first day of coaching my youngest team. My youngest player was a six-year-old named Achintia. Now, Achintia was very excited for his first day of football. In fact, Achintia, on his very first day, came running out onto the pitch, and he began yelling, pass, pass, pass. And I noticed that Achintia was yelling pass even whenever the other team had the ball. Now, Achintia was yelling pass whenever he was miles away from the action. And Achintia was yelling pass even whenever he had the ball. So then he was running with the ball, going pass, pass, pass. And so I looked at Achintia and I said, Achintia, why are you yelling pass? And he looked up at me and he said, Miss Amber, ma'am, I do not know what it means. I only know it is a football word. So 
Sometimes I hear organizations, sometimes I hear leaders sound a little bit like my friend Achinthia, yelling, leadership, creativity, collaboration, innovation, implementation, we got this. Because we know that these are good words and they can lead to big goals. But if we are in the wrong position, if we're miles away from the action, or even if we have the ball and we don't know in which direction we're going, then saying these words are not only ineffective, but they're actually detrimental. Eventually, the team is going to tune you out. The way that they tuned out my friend Achinthia. But if we take the time to become inspired to create the future, and then we effectively move from ideation to implementation using Cotter's model, then we'll be in a position to yell pass, to receive the ball, to move forward and to score really big goals. I wanna thank you all so much for having me here today. Uh, yeah, thank you all so much. Continue throughout today. Be inspired by all of these sessions. Be inspired with new ideas and take these tools to implement them within your teams as we continue to create the future. Thank you so much. I have just a few minutes for questions. Yeah, I'll be here if anyone has any.